You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, everyone. My name is Wesley Livesey from the History of the Second World War podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, starting not with the beginning of the war itself, but almost two decades earlier, to try and determine why and how the nations of the world would find themselves in a worldwide conflict just 20 years after the devastation of the First World War. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms or at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. To raise your right hand, repeat after me. I, Michael Richard Pence, do solemnly swear. I, Michael Richard Pence, do solemnly swear. And Kamala J. Harris, do solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution. That I will support and defend the Constitution. That I will support and defend the Constitution. Against all enemies. Against foreign all enemies. enemies foreign enemies. Against, foreign enemies. against all enemies. All foreign enemies. Foreign enemies. Preservation. Splendid misery. A man in a cataleptic fit, unable to speak. The fifth wheel on the coach of government the last cookie on the plate, the spare tire, the next highest job in the executive branch and the lowest at the same time, the pitcher of warm spit, a nullity, a nothing, a sand trap of American politics. These all tell you about this office. As President Biden said, the job is, and he used the B word. Of course, he didn't say that in a large public speech. He said it to the vice president of the Harvard student body. I mean, you'd have to not be reading news at all to not see headlines about Kamala Harris and the job she's doing as vice president. It's more a discussion of vice presidents than we normally get. Probably the exception of recent vice presidents would be Quayle and Cheney. It's not to say there always is the occasional, you know, especially Washington insider stories about the president and the relationship between the vice president and the president. Are they having lunches together and the like? There's a lot of different headlines that you're seeing. Oh, the poll ratings are slipping. Oh, there's the dissension among her staff. Oh, she's not being treated well by the Biden people and the like. And as someone who looks at the history and specifically has a soul side podcast about vice presidents. You know, like everything, I have to contextualize a bit. I just can't get away from thinking all the things you're talking about have certainly been true in history. For instance, president staff being a little suspicious of and or just kind of monitoring the activity of the vice president has to be the case with almost every, really every vice president. I'm probably going to say there the exception is Cheney. Vice President constitutionally is the only person who doesn't work for the president in a sense, constitutionally, has a job that's defined, is elected per the 12th Amendment by the American people in the same election as the president. Then you get into politics, and it's almost as if the vice president works for the president. And the 12th Amendment gives it, to, in effect, to political parties or some organization that can elect a president and vice president to decide on a single ticket. So it's not like parties are in the Constitution. It's not like the Constitution says the vice president works for the president. Not only does it not, it actually defines roles outside the presidency. But the 12th Amendment ties the vice president to the politics of a party, and if not a party, some type of organization, to that president. 
you want to be on this ticket, you'll do as I say. You want to run again, you'll do as I say. Those factors always have been present. That power has been used. You start with the very first after the 12th, and that's Aaron Burr. He's not chosen for the vice presidential ticket of 1804 again. He has completed his duel with Hamilton, resulting in Hamilton's death. Jefferson is still, and others are still a bit suspicious about his conduct during the 1800 election. They're going to run popular and powerful governor of New York, George Clinton, on the vice presidential slot. Aaron Burr becomes the first one. He won't be the last. You have John Calhoun, who is vice president under... John Quincy Adams, who then becomes vice president under Andrew Jackson after disputes with that president, he'll end up twice being removed from tickets because in 1832, it's Martin Van Buren, secretary of state under Andrew Jackson, who becomes vice president. Skylar Colfax, during the Grant administration, is useful to Grant in the beginning. He's a leader in Congress, a former Speaker of House. Seems like a good ticket. He's also from Indiana. That's a state that you want to win. But after he gets caught up in the Credit Mobilier scandal about the bribing of congressmen, he's replaced by Henry Wilson. Yeah, I mean, you know, so it, it, it's made pretty clear through that mechanism, if not others, that even if the Constitution says you have separate duties, those duties are being the president of the Senate, the presiding officer of the Senate, which gives you the ability to break ties, does not make you a senator. Okay, did you get my uh, report on some of the things? Yes, sir, I went over all of them, and I'm proud of them. But this is the stud up. For Hubert Humphrey, there was a satirical song written by songwriter and musician Tom Lair titled, Whatever Became of Hubert, about what happened when this great fighter for civil rights and other liberal causes went from being a senator to being vice president. Whatever became of Hubert, has anyone heard a thing? Once he's shown on his own, now he sits alone and waits for the phone to ring. Once a fiery liberal spirit, ah, but now when he speaks, he must clear it. Now, when we get that done, you can go talk about what you have done. But until we get it done, put everything else secondary. However, it's not a cabinet office. That's true. The president can't fire the vice president. And you have also seen some independence. It is the person that can go in there and speak. Certainly, as recently as Pence, there's a quote from him where he says, you know, the job of the president is walk in, close the door, and give the president the truth. I don't know how those meetings went. Um, but when the door is open, you stand next to the president, et cetera, et cetera. Gore certainly felt that way. Gore pushed certain agenda items. Walter Mondale felt that way in his relationship with Carter. Like Gore, he was serving a president where they would have lunches, where he had certain... Walter Mondale's not a fan of Carter's Malaise speech, where he gets on TV and talks about the... You know, he doesn't use that word. That's the way it's labeled by opponents. But he doesn't like the speech in general. Wanted a more traditional speech from the president. Keeps his criticism on the inside. That's how you do it. When George H.W. Bush is serving uh, in the Reagan administration as vice president, Nancy Reagan wanted him to fall on the sword during the Iran-Contra hearing, or at least be the one that goes in and fires the chief of staff, Don Reagan. Bush would not do that. A clear sign that it's, that's not my job. It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you a good partner for me, and I think a good partner for our country and the world. So I now announce officially that I will send the name of Nelson Rockefeller to the Congress of the United States for confirmation. Nelson. Good article from Bill Scher, uh, who's been on this show, in the Washington Monthly. Vice presidents get no respect. Kamala Harris is no exception. Cut the history, making number two a break, Scher says. The problem is the job, not her. Does she deserve these critiques? Is she held to a different standard than her white male predecessors? To answer this question, we should appreciate the historical nature 
of the Harris vice presidency share rights. By that, I'm not just referring to Harris's race and gender, though of course those are highly relevant factors. I'm referring to her lack of Washington experience relative to the president. It's a good point that he makes, because it is kind of rare. Usually you have kind of the Obama-Biden, Bush-Cheney situation. You could even go as far as to say Clinton-Gore, because when you're talking about Washington and the Congress, all three of those vice presidents had more experience. Uh, You could certainly say that about Pence and Trump, Pence a former congressman. You could certainly say it about Mondale. Yeah, really the same thing, H.W. Bush. It's How far do we have to go back? That's a great question. You know, Garner has a ton of experience, former Speaker of the House. You know, Curtis has a lot of experience. So does Hoover. Dawes has a ton of experience with administrations. Yeah, what you really have to go back to to find a vice president who doesn't have the experience level of the president in Washington, say, Nelson Rockefeller and his kind of quick vice presidency from 1974 to early 1977. So you have to go to Coolidge, really. Coolidge and Rockefeller are the two examples I'd pull out where you have vice presidents that had actually less experience than the president they were running under. Unique circumstances for both. The the key thing to understand with Coolidge is that he was the choice of the convention, not the choice of Harding. And then I guess if you're going to say Coolidge, you go to the one right after him, right before him is Marshall, total uh, neophyte. Wilson doesn't have much experience either, so that's kind of an uh, interesting ticket. Indiana is part of the reason behind that. Garrett Hobart is only a uh, New Jersey Republican, has no experience in Washington. When McKinley picks him, you go, uh, really political reasons for that. So each time when you see that there's not a... And, and it's been few. There's some politics behind it. We're picking a person that's popular with some particular group of the party. Kamala Harris, of course, fits right into it. It's pretty simple. It's pretty obvious. I mean, the Democrats were about to give the presidency to not only another white man, but an older one. So going with the younger woman, African-American, is exactly the balance that was needed. And Biden literally went into his VP search, limiting his choices to first women and then African-American women. Recent articles you've seen, that this is a November article showing Gallup poll results slow as 41% approval. But then when you look at specific demographic groups, 48% among women, 72% among African-Americans, 83% among Democrats. So you're seeing like pretty, it's pretty dependent on who you're talking about as to the level of support. Those percentage numbers are lower than other VPs at this time. But it's also fair to say that there's been a tremendous focus on Harris that you haven't seen with VPs since, say, Cheney or Quayle, because it's well known. I mean, President Biden's the oldest to serve. There's a constant watch on his health, and opponents are more interested, let's say, in in Harris than others. Is it also her performance? Yeah, a brilliant politician and a very skilled person would be able to kind of skate over those attacks in a particular situation. And I think they did choose someone who didn't have a long time serving in the Senate. While she had run a national campaign and, you know, wasn't someone that necessarily some some camera lights are going to shock her, right, had been in presidential debates and the like, she was a relative newcomer. If you look at the office of the vice presidency, there are so many vice presidents really built up their whole careers before it and then did very little as vice presidents. If you look at the totality of the people who served in the office, I'm thinking of Charles Dawes. Tremendous success in banking, running, uh, being a cabinet member and running congressional budgets of the United States. Then vice president, we can't remember anything that he did. Uh, Need I mention Theodore Roosevelt? He didn't serve long, but nobody remembers what he did as vice president. Barclay's majority leader for the Democrats. And he's, he's remembered, you know, he pushes the office. He's involved in meetings, but his great successes were behind him. Certainly see that with Nelson Rockefeller. You certainly see that with Humphrey. I mean, Humphrey's a guy where the vice presidential office may have destroyed him. And there's a tape where Lyndon Johnson actually kind of predicts it. You know, at least predicts this is going to be the end of our friendship, he tells uh, 
he tells Humphrey, you're not going to like this very much. It's a terrible job. I mean, all these things he tells him, you got to give him some credit. He tells him right in the job interview there. It's a strange office. It's doesn't have, def- it has only the few constitutional defined duties and everyone knows that's not really what he's going to take up a whole day. Doesn't have a defined sense of duty. Some of that has to come from the president and it doesn't have defined goals. That makes it kind of nebulous. And that's kind of like Bill Scherer's point that this office is really not always respected. In April 1967, Humphreys in Florence, Italy, a 23-year-old man throws eggs at the vice president. He missed. But then later in Belgium, demonstrators throw rotten eggs and fruits at Vice President Humphrey's car. Nixon is sent on a goodwill trip in Latin America in 1958. The U.S. had awarded the Legion of Merit Medal to a Venezuelan dictator. Venezuelans didn't like this very much. He's in Caracas and a crowd of Venezuelans shout anti-American slogans and stop Nixon's motorcade through the capital city attack the car, damage its body, smash windows. Secret Service agents cover the vice president. One pulls out his weapon. There's no shots. And miraculously, they are able to escape the crowd and speed away. Eisenhower has to send troops to the Caribbean area just in case Nixon has to be removed. Thomas Hendricks was asked about his relationship with the president he was serving under as vice president, Grover Cleveland. He had not spoken to him in four months, but he said... I know if I do speak to him, it'll be very agreeable. Breckenridge serves under James Buchanan. He's asked for influence over some of the appointments of his home state. He's asked for influence on policy. He's upset and he lets it be known Buchanan hasn't invited him to the office to consult with him. And so Buchanan does. He finds out and they get to the meeting. And Buchanan says, I wanted to request Americans have a day of prayer And here's the message. I wanted to consult you about that. You, Mr. President, through your dedication and your openness, have already reawakened faith and hope. If at any time you want me to step aside, I'll hand you a letter of withdrawal. It's a rough moment for the Ford White House. And it's a moment that Ford said in a book of statements to be published after his death that he regretted the most. And that was dropping his vice president from the ticket in 1976. But when he brought it up to his vice president, Nelson Rockefeller, Rockefeller's response was, Mr. President, nothing's more important than your nomination and election. Anything you want, I'll do. I'll be on the ticket. I'll be off the ticket, whatever you want. Hello, everyone. My name is Wesley Livesey from the History of the Second World War podcast. My podcast is a mostly chronological retelling of the Second World War, starting not with the beginning of the war itself, but almost two decades earlier, to try and determine why and how the nations of the world would find themselves in a worldwide conflict just 20 years after the devastation of the First World War. You can find History of the Second World War on all major podcast platforms or at historyofthesecondworldwar.com. Hutchinson, Minnesota had some problems. For the adults of Hutchinson, the problem was the teenagers. They kept sneaking off at night to empty barns where they'd brace yourself, dance. Who knew what sort of sin and heavy petting and French literature these barn dances might lead to? No, the adults of Hutchinson, Minnesota did not approve. And neither, it seemed, did the devil. One summer night, Satan himself suddenly appeared in the middle of the dance floor, and the debauched teens ran in fear. He showed up at the next dance, too. For a few months, it seemed like you couldn't go to a late-night barn dance in Hutchinson without getting chased out by the devil, pitchfork in tow. Until one night, when a 14-year-old boy had the good sense to shoot him in the chest. At which point the devil was revealed, Scooby-Doo style but bloodier, to be the local Methodist minister, dressed in a costume and flown in from the roof by rope and pulley. This is The Constant, a history of getting things wrong. I'm Mark Chrysler. Every episode, we look at the accidents, mistakes, and bad ideas that helped misshape our world. Find us at ConstantPodcast.com or wherever you get your podcasts. We as a people and we as a nation have the will, the determination, and the capability to overcome the hard realities of our times. 
This was pretty far from the auspicious beginning when Ford took over as president and just really within the month asked the Congress to approve Nelson Rockefeller as vice president. In fact, when the Congress wants to put it off until the next year in January, Ford is furious. He calls up Speaker Albert, Senate Majority Leader Mike Mansfield, and said, you can't do this to the country. You can't do it to Nelson Rockefeller. You can't do it to me. It's in the national interest that you confirm this VP. It's one of several names he's considering. It could have been George H.W. Bush. That was another name that Ford was considering at the time. And it could have been Donald Rumsfeld, one of Nixon's domestic policy advisors and a former congressman. These were all candidates for Ford's VP. This is what Ford said. Some of my staff felt that Rockefeller was too strong that he tried to dominate the administration. That didn't worry me. So it is kind of a brave choice. It shows that Ford had confidence to pick somebody of the stature of Rockefeller. And it's quite different than the norm. So maybe pick someone that's, you know, from a different part of the party. I think the key is Ford is more of a moderate Republican and chosen, really chosen by the Democrats who, after Agnew's resignation, kind of got their pick, you know, that he's more of a moderate. So probably what Ford should have wanted to do is to pick a more conservative Republican. Now, he probably is going to have trouble getting that through the Congress, but maybe shaming them the same way he shamed them as the timing of the decision he could have. Had he picked someone like that, say a Bob Dole, he might have staved off the Reagan challenge. In choosing Rockefeller, the politics were awful for Ford, really. Rockefeller had been present at the 1964 Republican convention, Cowtown, right outside of San Francisco, and Goldwater was getting the nomination. Conservatives had surged and were taking over the party for that election. Rockefeller speaks out. President Eisenhower said only two hours ago from this very rostrum, the Republican Party should reject extremism from either the left or the right. And that's remembered. And so among other people, you've got one vote against Nelson Rockefeller to begin with, and that's Goldwater, who's still a senator. Jesse Helms of North Carolina also votes against him. You have conservatives against his choice right from the beginning. Reagan speaking out against him. You know, they thought, I believe that Ford thought that such a big name for his presidency, someone who is the first unelected president, would help boost the image of this fledgling administration that really is only there because Nixon resigned. Ford is a pretty new vice president as it is. So they think they're going to get a big boost of this. They also believe, and this is quite a need that they have, so many of Nixon's folks had resigned that they're running the White House on a little bit of a thin staff, and Nelson Rockefeller is going to be able to bring in talented people from New York immediately to help staff things. In doing that, And this is a lesson for future vice presidents. He butts heads immediately with Donald Rumsfeld, who's running uh, domestic operations. So in the end, you can't count Rockefeller as being someone helpful to Ford as a vice president. He reduced the chances that Ford would get the nomination of his party. But the way that it's done is unceremoniously. And Howard Calloway, who is Ford's campaign manager, Bo Calloway's called, he's from Georgia, um, has a kind of folksy manner. Once he hears from Ford that Nelson Rockefeller is okay with giving up his position on the ticket, this is how he spins it. A lot of Reagan people are not supporters of Rockefeller. We want their support for Ford, whether they support Rockefeller or not. Then he tells reporters, Rockefeller is the campaign's number one problem. You and I both know that if Rockefeller took himself out, It would help with the nomination. Ford needs a younger man. So anyway, Rockefeller was pretty upset about that, called Callaway. I did not have an agreement to allow you to make a statement like that. So it's pretty unceremoniously the way it happened. This office evolves, and it's all about the relationship between the president and the vice president, and that changes with each administration. You get to Mondale, and Mondale makes it clear, having talked to Rockefeller, talked to Humphrey, he was, he was Humphrey's friend. Mondale makes it clear, I don't want a defined duty. I will help you where you need help. I will give you advice where you need advice. 
Mondale is the first vice president to have an office in the White House and that, you know, in the West Wing, that speaks volumes. So everyone, Nixon, Humphrey, they're all in the executive office building far away. Clinton gives Al Gore the job of reinventing government. And it's something that when you look at kind of where that administration came from, from the 92 election, you had Perot, and he was attacking all the deficit spending and things like that. That reinventing government sounded good, but it was something that just didn't resonate with people. People were way more excited about, like, say, family leave or um, Medicare, Social Security, or other issues. Gore tries to push in the, in the first economic stimulus package a BTU tax, help the deficit, and also, which they wanted to do to lower interest rates, and also you know, try to rein in the use of fossil fuel. So that BTU tax is pretty quickly traded away in the administration's first negotiations with Congress, and it's a Congress of its own party. Gore is one of many vice presidents that finds that although he was chummy with certain senators when he was one of the hundred, when he becomes vice president, you know, he can't always get them on the phone or they don't agree or their agenda is going to be more important than the call from friendly old Al. Here's what Bill Scherer says. Whenever Kamala Harris leaves the country, the knives come out. In June, Harris's diplomatic mission to Mexico and Guatemala triggered criticism from the left for saying to potential migrants, do not come to the U.S., and criticism from the right for awkward responses to questions about why she hadn't yet visited the border. In August, while Harris was visiting Singapore, several conservative media outlets tried to gin up a controversy when she briefly chuckled before turning serious and answering reporters' questions about the Afghanistan pullout. There's a lot of that criticism of her, quote, laughing. Here's what uh, Jennifer Palomari said. She had been involved with Hillary Clinton's 2016 campaign and has written books about women in politics. For Harris, it's like, we don't like the sound of her laugh. We don't like when she laughs. Bush had a smug smirk, and it was bad. These things define women in a way and linger for women leaders in a way that they don't for men. So yes, we described it on a previous episode, but Calvin Coolidge gets into the vice presidency. And remember, he isn't the studied, decided choice of professional politicians, nor did Senator Harding pick him. Presidential candidates didn't really do that in those days, nor was there even the cigar smoke filled room that was talked about. That probably didn't even happen with the presidential choice. But it certainly didn't happen with the vice presidential choice. That was a choice of the convention. So first of all, he's in the news because he had just broken a public strike of police officers in Boston. When the mayor couldn't get it done, he got involved as governor. So he had a little bit of like um, buzz because of that. And he also was not the political choice. So Harding was seen by many members of the convention of kind of being forced upon them. And the convention wanted their own choice. And it's really uh, Calvin Coolidge comes out of that process. So Coolidge becomes VP. There's this moment where they're in the uh, Senate cafeteria and a young senator from North Dakota says to some of the other senators, why aren't you sitting and eating lunch with our presiding officer, the vice president? And he points over to Calvin Coolidge and the elder senators say, spend your time eating lunch with somebody more important. There was no indication that Harding was going to die. Probably in 1924, they were going to look at other people, maybe Dawes. Coolidge would be out. He wasn't really adding a lot of value. Just a very similar situation. John Adams has this famous quote, right? I am nothing, but I could be everything. So the vice president in history goes through the office as a kind of nullity, as one said. But at any moment, because of circumstances that have nothing to do with their performance could be transformed into the most powerful person in the country. So, and I think that's the same as Kamala Harris and the way that you have to look at this, regardless of what side you come from on politics, is that there is any moment where Biden is not able to continue with the job or decides not to continue with the job. Harris becomes president and everything is different. Now you may say, that's horrible or that's great given your politics. And that's fine. That is what it's about. I can't go in there and, you know, 
go into your brain and tell you what to think. But what I would think you should consider is that the whole equation changes at that point. And there's a more of a gravity to the office, to the decisions, more of a focus on her. If you look at Bill Scher's article, that's what he's arguing here. Even the most successful vice presidents, Scher writes, struggle with the contradictions of the job. You need to be prepared to be president, but you don't have any powers save breaking ties in the Senate. You need to show absolute loyalty to the president, but maintain your distinctive political persona. It's no wonder that since the 12th Amendment revamp of how vice presidents are elected, only two sitting vice presidents have won presidential election, and just one in modern times, George H.W. Bush. The other, of course, is Martin Van Buren. Joe Biden had to actually sit one out. So as vice president, eight years under Obama, Biden could not clear the field, could not. And there was some notes that he was interested in it, but there was no way. And you had Hillary Clinton, former rival to Obama and secretary of state in that position. His service as vice president wasn't enough to guarantee him the spot. There are Democratic operatives talking now that uh, Bill Scher has in his article. She isn't going to clear the field, they say about Harris. And I think that should be expected. If you get to 2024 and Biden decides he does not want to run again, that does not guarantee that Harris is the nominee of the Democratic Party. There would be a very active primary. And I think that should be expected. Four years is not enough time. If you get to eight years and you're talking about 2028, I think you have a very different equation, but you still don't have a complete clearing of the field. Like I said, the example with Biden or George H.W. Bush, who had to take on a very strong challenge from Bob Bob Dole. Bob Dole almost got the nomination. Uh, Bill Scheer has another good point in his article. Mondale was one of the closest vice presidents. But when the Carter administration started unraveling, and this is Stuart Eisenstadt, a member of the Carter administration, saying this, when it began unraveling in its last year, Mondale was caught up in it. Mondale was so livid when Carter chose to blame a public crisis of confidence for the nation's economic difficulties, and then to ask for his entire cabinet to submit resignations, that he privately mused about quitting. It saddled him with Carter's economic record. Now, I do believe that as a vice president, you're saddled with the administration no matter what. It's not going to be possible to run from the administration, but to be against what the president is doing. Not possible in a modern time. So uh, go ahead and read Bill Share's article in the Washington Monthly. Follow him on Twitter at Bill Share, S-H-E-R. So what can we say about this, right? Um... I think it's too early to make political judgments. People are going to do it. I'm not. But there's a couple of things to consider. It may well be that this office of the vice presidency does not offer enough stated goals, like what is it that you're supposed to do and how do you measure success, that it has a history of confining the person who has the office because they have to be loyal to someone else. And it also doesn't have powers, really. So the person never gets the chance to look good. So you could have this kind of neutral position that we really can't judge VPs unless they become president and we judge them. But that seems like a cop-out too, because I think that even though there aren't set measurements of job performance, right? Like we're certainly not saying, well, you broke more ties than anyone else. Or you presided over the Senate better than anyone else. Uh, Spiro Agno tried to actually do that in his early months to actually be in the Senate every day, which VPs hadn't done. It didn't work out so well. That's not really what we judged them on. But to kind of avoid the cop out there, you could say, look, the job of a vice president is to make the president they're serving look good, to be a source of political strength inside the Beltway, outside the Beltway for that administration, to be someone that when called upon in a task, you feel confidence, to have very good prospects for being the VP candidate the next time around and being the presidential candidate in the next election when the slot is open. Um, So preserving your own politics, the president's politics, and your party's politics. 
right? It would seem like if you're doing a good job in the office, all of those things are good. So you can make judgments if you kind of believe that. And there's only one exception, and that is the lightning rod type VP. And you have that in Dick Cheney, self-professed when asked by reporters, was he a lightning rod for George W. Bush? I take the criticism on. I embrace it. He didn't want to run for president anyway. That is a role. That's at least one precedent there. I also think Agnew at some times, from the time that he became vice president, 69, up until, say, the 72 election, Agnew was definitely someone that helped with his conservative flank and helped him take criticism and acted in many ways as Nixon's Nixon, which was the way Haldeman described it. In other words, he was taking on media and pundits and doing things that were seen as very aggressive in that time and very negative in that time and didn't really care. Um, The only issue with him as a lightning rod is he probably, um, he certainly turned against Nixon at a certain point and, um, you know, entertained at least getting the nomination in 76, which Nixon very much did not want. Things got very sour and he wasn't a total like, I'll take a bullet for you, Tyke VP. It just sort of worked that way politically for the first few years. Agnew was somebody that Nixon could send down south. He was somebody that he could send to speak to conservative groups and Republican partisans who might otherwise have seen Nixon as moderating on certain issues. You got to have somebody that had not a coward. And when the going gets tough and everything gets rough and will within the year, you got to have somebody that will just get in a little bit closer and stay a little bit longer. He's got to have a wife like yours. He's got to have a family like yours. He's got to have somebody as near as that. Now, that's the best uh, dimensions I know. Who fits that, I just really honestly don't know. I know a good many that don't fit it. You don't want another lodge campaign. You don't want another Garner. You don't want another Wallace. And you just cannot tell at what all is gold. All is not gold that glitters. And I think the one mistake you're going to make is the same mistake I made. And I think you already made it. And I think you're going to make it every day. It's your shorter troops, your shorter riders, your shorter managers, your shorter young, able folks, your shorter money primarily. It comes from your father and mother. You didn't inherit it. And as a consequence, you're going to have to take people who are not always as loyal as you've been to me, and pretty soon they'll turn things over to another group. I know that's what I'm worried. But here's the problem with the lightning run. You have to accept that you are one for the strategy to work. And certainly viable for someone like um, Harris to turn around and say, hey, you know what? I'm the lightning rod here. Yeah, I'm taking some heat, but I'm doing that for the administration. I'm just not hearing that in any transparent way, so I can't, like say that that's what's going on. So look, this is an office that I could run through those names again. We can run through that long list of names. Most of them were not choices for president. Some were, some, most of them were the people who didn't win their party's convention, but got enough votes from enough people. That's really been the history of this office more often than not. So you can look at that history that way, or you can just say, look, We have somebody that's still learning, perhaps will get better over time. And both those things are possible. We just need more time to look at this political situation as it unfolds. And you can also say this person's under very severe attack. Or, as I heard a reporter spin it in a more positive way for his profession, hey, this is a VP that can be more likely to be president than any other. So we're going to criticize Either way, there's a greater amount of attention. All of those thoughts are viable. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. You like the program, please tell someone about it.